Good evening and welcome to another episode of A Politically Incorrect Guyana. My name is Kian Jabur and as usual, I am your host this evening. Well, it's just me today and I thought we would have a nice, calm, fluid chat because I know there's a lot going on in Guyana and there's a lot that I have been doing over the past couple of months that I really and truly just like to discuss with Guyana and share some thoughts on some things that have been occurring from my personal perspective. Um, what I'm also going to do today is I have my apolitical phone with me. I tell everyone all the time, if you're ever trying to reach out to me outside of when we're live, please send WhatsApp messages because the phone isn't always with me. But that is our number on the screen down here. <laughs> um, six. Uh, oh, that might be the old number. There we go. <laughs> six, eight, nine. 8474. So please, I have my phone with me on WhatsApp or if you're local, that's the local number. Both of them you can reach out. Please feel free to call me anytime during the show. I'm going to be taking some calls and just discussing the various topics that either you would like to discuss or that I am bringing up this evening. So um, what we're going to start off with is um, the CPL has started. Let's start with some good news. The CPL has begun, and we all love the CPL. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to be one of those. Is it our year? Is it not our year? Um, the team, as usual, is strong. What um, What I'm very excited about, though, is a friend of mine, uh, Leon Johnson, is now the new manager of the Amazon Warriors. Somebody whom I'm hoping is going to make uh, as big an impact on the field as he does off the field. He's a good guy. He's young, um, very progressive thinker. So um, I'm looking forward to see how the team evolves from here on out. Obviously, I'm a Guyana Amazon Warriors fan till the end of me. I know it's still a franchise sport, but nonetheless, it's kind of the closest thing we have to a national cricket team, I guess. I know we have the Harp Eagles, I think, um, and those guys do quite well. But nonetheless, the Warriors has kind of captured everyone's heart. There's also some big concerts and shows, which I'm always a big fan of. Um, you know, when it comes to making sure everybody in Guyana at least has a outlet to any stresses they're dealing with. It's always a good uh, unifier in society. That that also is probably my biggest uh, my biggest um, uh, love for cricket is, I know you hear it every year, but it's one of those situations that every time you walk into the stadium, it kind of just takes you aback and you really kind of bask in it, hoping that it can always be this way. But the way all of Guyana comes together, all the races, you know, um, genders, you know, everybody just kind of sets aside any differences they have and puts it all into the love of cricket. So, and more importantly, the Warriors in this case. So um, I know the Amazon Warriors first game is tomorrow, Saturday. And uh, I'm sure like everybody else, we're all going to be glued to our television. So let's keep our fingers crossed. This is what sports is. I'm a big sports fan myself. And um, like everything else in life, I think you need to have the lows to really enjoy the highs. So, so that's what sports is, right? It gives us a little bit of hope. It gives us something to work towards. So good luck to the Warriors, and we will all be rooting for you. So um, that is a little bit of good news, uh, <laughs> something to keep us going. But um, I'm going to start to try and cover some topics uh, that have been in the news lately. More importantly, today over the last, um, over the last couple of days. So I'm going to start with a very interesting topic i'm here to obviously as i will continuously say to everybody in this country i walk the not very trotted path meaning not a lot of people come in the direction that i am heading in because at the end of the day we have two main political parties in this country that i don't neither of which i subscribe to so at the end of the day um if 90 percent of that country of, of Guyana votes for either the PPP or the PNC, then there's really and truly only very, very few people that, you know, the 10% down the middle. And I try my best to look at things from as an unbiased perspective as possible. Um, I do uh, support all third parties. That is my political preference. I believe that there needs to be a balance in parliament. I believe that some of the power that lies in our two-party system needs to come back down to the people of the country. And I believe the only way to do that is through constitutional reform. And the more I divulge uh, myself into politics is the more I realize that we have some very, very serious systematic changes that need to occur in this country in order for 
everyone to start benefiting equally, but more importantly, to hold our leaders accountable. You see, what a lot of people fail, I think, to understand from my perspective is not that I want to get rid of the PPP or the PNC. At the end of the day, a democracy, by definition, dictates that the majority rules. And 90% uh, of the country voting for either the PPP or the PNC means that those two parties should be the leading forces when making decisions for the country. Those are who the people have entrusted to lead them. I cannot sit down here and say, well, uh, you know, a third party should be ruling the country. That's not the case. What I would like is to end the two party dominance when after every election, only one party is completely in control. Meaning if we can have a, a, a minority government in parliament, then let's say for the PPP followers, the PPP can still rule. The PPP was, the Air Finale will still be the president, uh, Barra Jagdia will still be the vice president. But what happens is any decision that's made becomes much more inclusive. All of a sudden, they need to consult rather than making decisions on their own behind closed doors. And again, transparency is key to, to, to dismantling any corrupt situation. So if you, as uh, Mr. Jonas even said it uh, a week ago, I think, um, as he said, if you can have the PPP, the PNC, and a third party, all having equal say in a, in, in, on our board of directors, whether it be for GRDB, whether it be for GPL, whether it be for the tender board, whether it be in parliament, we're on all the committees, the reality is all of a sudden the decisions being made now will reflect what all the people want because there is a representative that is ensuring that all those people have their um, have their rights and, and their benefits looking, looked after, their, their opportunities being sought after. Because if you just have one group of people that represents half the country and they're making all the decisions, then who's representing the other half of the country? And that's, I, 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 I try to jump ahead of the arguments that I know come about, but my party, either the PNC or the PVP, my party rules for all Guyana. And that's what every party loyalist says. My party rules for everyone. And at the end of the day, I think we can all argue here that 90% of this country, whether, whether your party loyalists, whether the PVP or the PNC are not benefiting. So when everybody says my government, the PVP or the PNC rule for all people, my question is that how is it that 90% of the country is still impoverished? How is it that we are dealing with crime rates through the, through the roof? How are we dealing with social ills like suicide that's some of the highest in the world or, or addiction or anything, you know, domestic violence, anything, any social ills that come with, um, with a country of people that are struggling, a country of people that are not being able to deal with their current lifestyle in an adequate or, or um, healthy manner. I mean, you have to start wondering that. I mean, every day, every day in the news, every day, pick up the papers. It's either some suicide or drunk driving accident or murder or robbery. And you begin to wonder to yourself, why is this happening so much? What is the cause of this much social ills in a country of 700,000 people, of less than a million and then to top that off, a country with the, one of the highest GDPs in the world now. We're talking about as high as a country like Saudi Arabia. We're talking about one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So for all of you that don't understand the GDP conversation, the amount of income that the country is earning divided by the amount of people we have in the country, that's our GDP. And it is so high now because of oil money that we are rich beyond comprehension. We are filthy rich. I am I preach it every day. I preach it every show. Do the math. Any of you are welcome to do it. I'll do a little breakdown soon. I, I have done it before on my previous shows that every day now with the three rigs outside, with the three rigs offshore, right? Um, pumping up now almost a million barrels a day. All right. What you have is our 50% of the oil, the profit oil, and our 2% royalty, 
So this is what is our percentage after expenses are taken out. We are making on that 50% profit plus our 2% royalty, almost 10 million US dollars every 24 hours. Every time you go to sleep and wake up, Guyana as a country, as the people are 10 million US dollars richer. So now you sit there and you wonder to yourself, well, how is the country earning that much money? But we're still having these issues. Now, one of these issues I'd like to discuss, I'll ask uh, the operator to please bring up um, one of the recent headlines with the nurses. Um, this was brought up by, um, this was actually said by the uh, the CEO of, of uh, Georgetown Public Hospital, that almost 100 nurses have resigned from public hospital in the first six months of 2023. The country's main medical institution, the Georgetown Public Hospital, is facing a worrying shortage of nurses uh, as more nurses and other medical staff continue to leave their jobs at the hospital for opportunities elsewhere. Now, this is in the headlines. This Again, this source is the CEO of the public hospital. This is not coming from a random opposition source or somewhere else. Understand that if we are losing nurses at this type of rate, you have to start to ask yourself why, okay? This is not a normal amount of people resigning, all right? We already know that there's a mass shortage of medical workers in this country. So my question to you is, and let, let, I'll talk directly, I'm not even gonna divulge into the teachers or the engineers or anybody else along those lines. Let's just talk about the nurses because that's where, uh, or the medical professionals, because that's where this article is stemming from. Now, again, we all know that these nurses are horrifically underpaid. We all know the conditions that they're dealing with in working for, in public hospital. They're not given the right tools. They're not given, they're not given up, um, the right time off. They're not given the right conditions, whether it be toilet facilities, whether it be benefits for their families. You really end up in a position where as a, as a trained professional, medical professional, you wonder to yourself, well, if the whole world is looking for trained medical professionals, why would I put myself through this? Why would I accept what is it, $200,000 a month, 1000 US a month, working 12-hour shifts? I mean, and then, and then piss-poor conditions, and then people talking down to you, and really and truly just a complete lack of respect. And you sit there and you say, well, where am I getting that information from? And I'm, I mean, why else would the nurses be resigning? Where, where do you guys think they're going? So as the backbone, as a pillar of our society, which is our medical care system, we have to now wonder to ourselves, well, what exactly are all these nurses resigning for? And then we have to question the management of the system, right? Don't, don't, don't sit down here and paint over the fact that, oh, but the government is putting training programs in place to train more nurses, so we'll cover it. I mean, I'm sorry, look at things a little unbiased. Obviously, when those nurses are now trained, if they are not taken care of and paid properly and put in the right working conditions and given a healthy, sustainable, um, um, professional career, they're going to just leave too, aren't they? Isn't that all that's going to happen? Countries like England, countries like Canada, all over the world, even the Caribbean, taking these nurses and they're just leaving. Why wouldn't they? So now I have to ask you, Let's define progress. Is building a road progress? I guess so. Is building a bridge progress? Yes, absolutely. Is training people progress? Yes, absolutely. Now, if we're in a system where the people are struggling to survive to the point where they have to leave, then all that progress that is discussed in those other areas is null and void. Because if you're building a road, but yet your nurses can't afford to drive on it, then is it actually beneficial to the people? And that's what you really need to start questioning here. Not these big contracts being given out. They're even building new hospitals. Now, if you are 
uh, if you are saying that there's a worrying shortage of medical professionals, and now you're just going and building new hospitals, who's working? Who, how is the standard of our medical industry raising? How are the people of the country benefiting if all of our doctors and nurses are not, are not even taken care of? How do we expect them to take care of us? We hear the horror stories every day in the news. Every single day, you hear of, of, of somebody dying in the hospital. You hear, I, I just read, a, um, I just watched an interview with our health minister stating that, that the, 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 the people, um, you, you need a friendly face. The, the, the nurses need to more, be more hospitable. We want to raise the standard. I don't know about you guys, but how I view this is if I work at the job and they're not paying me properly, and they have me in a contract that I can't leave or go and work privately, and they're not giving me any kind of facilities, and I work in my tail off 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day, and then I'm treated like garbage, and the money that I'm getting paid can't even take care of my family, or buy me a new car, or, or, or put a down payment on a house, or, or any sort of luxury, carry me on a vacation once a year because they need a break, then I'm sorry. What are you expecting these people to do? I don't care how much training you put them through. They are not going to raise the standard in the country if they themselves, their own standard is not raised. If, 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 if our government is not taking care of the people, then what progress are we talking about? I don't know how to keep saying this. Engineers, professionals in this country, we just, every day we see a new scandal with who's corrupt, with, with, with what, with which, which, which government official got big house, which government official signed this contract and has done this and blah, 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 and who get kicked back. I, 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 you want to ask what their salaries are? You want to find out if those people are properly compensated? How much an engineer at, 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 at um, Ministry of Public Works making? How much do you think these guys that are in charge of, you know, vetting and handing out contracts? Three hundred thousand dollars a month, four hundred thousand dollars a month, and that's a big money. I know most of you sitting here going, "Well, that's a lot of money it, it, for for a professional, for somebody that's went to school to study and dedicated their lives to this." I'm sorry, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to what they're given outside. There's, which is why they're leaving, right? Or they're being corrupt. This right back down to police. What do you, you expect the police not to be corrupt at $70,000 a month starting salary? Those are the guys we got on the road. It sounds, well, of course, they're police. They have to be. No, stop putting the onus on the people that are suffering in the system. They have to figure out a way to survive. Stop saying something's wrong with the people. Everyone keeps blaming. All the government, everybody talked to. No, the people have a problem. No, the people don't have a problem. Because those same people, and I... I I know this show is watched far and wide, whether it be England, Canada, America, wherever you guys are. The same Guyanese go over there and work their tail off. Ask anybody. The same Guyanese that we're claiming are lazy and this and that, is them running out, them leaving Guyana, running out of the country and going to work their tail off over there. And guess what? Reaping the benefits. Ask any of them. Okay? And I'm always the first. And I'll talk a little bit about my personal now, um, recent, I guess education, because I'm, I'm a person that likes to travel as much as I can and see as much as I can of what's going on outside of Guyana. So you can kind of come back and, and contribute. I think that's what's necessary in, in, in any country or anywhere in the world. As, as a young person, I think my job is to gather as much knowledge and then come and depart as much of that knowledge as I can um, in order to help the people, my family, my friends, my society, my, you know, my community, and in this case, my country. And um, uh, recently I've been, I've been um, traveling quite a bit. I've been out of the country, in and out for the last couple months. Um, one of the countries I traveled to was Japan. And I was able to spend a couple of weeks in Japan. I was very fortunate, just my daughter and I, every year we take a trip. And I like to take her out. She's 11 now, and I like to take her out as much as I can, just so she can have that experience and kind of learn on her own and adapt. And, you know, she has her own kind of learning curve. While I go there and discuss politics or, you know, <laughs> um, social systems and stuff like that, uh, financial, economic values and so on, she goes there and kind of figures out, you know, how do we book a hotel? <laughs> how do we catch a bus? How do we, you know, adapt to a country? 
country in another language. So we all have, the two of us have our own little, um, our own little learning experiences. And um, Japan was phenomenal. And, and what, um, what one of the things I took away from the Japan is, is obviously me personally, is what you found in their society. And I, I tried to get, I, obviously I question politics and I talked to as many people as I can. I actually have a friend over there um, who I met up with who's actually a Guyanese guy. And we were able to have a wonderful couple of days of conversations as we toured Tokyo. Um, you know, him explaining all the little parts. He's lived there now for over 10 years. So just kind of the little things that they do in their society. And one of the conversations obviously was politics. And he said, what's very interesting about the country is Although there are different political parties, um, the government changes every now and again. What you find is the people themselves are very unified when decisions are made. So what happens is if a decision is made to raise taxes, the people are, yes, they're going to get upset. They're going to voice their concern, but they will abide by the system. What they're going to do is they're going to pay those high taxes. And then very calmly and then very professionally, very courteously, they're then going to move Come election time, they will then voice their concern, voice their change of heart or their 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 opinion at the polls. All right. And they, they have multiple. I, I think Japan has quite a few political parties. I think I, I can't remember the exact amount of told me, but I know it's more than two. Um, and what what was very interesting, though, is how he explains that the people, the people themselves understand that if everyone is not moving in the same direction, then you can't move at all because instead of everybody moving forward, all of a sudden you have two groups moving side to side and no actual forward movement. And that's always the case in Guyana because as our grandparents will say over and over and over, oh, this country has all the potential in the world. Oh, we could be the breadbasket. And people like Air Finale, uh, you know, whom I have a lot of respect for, may even have the right intention. But at the end of the day, due to our political system, it still can't work because the country is not unified. And we can pretend to sit here and say, oh, but but, but that's what the PVP is trying to do and the PVP are not trying to do. Well, I wanna bring up an article because this is all kind of moving forward to something. And I'll continue with Japan as you go on. I would like to ask um, uh, the operator, please, to bring up the next uh, headline, which is, um, yesterday, Barrett Jack Dio had a press conference in which he said that he, um, how can I ever debate a Norton? And excuse Nigel Darmalan in the back, but but nonetheless, um, the article states here, um, how can, uh, quoting uh, our vice president and arguably probably the most uh, powerful, powerful political figure in the country, how can I ever debate a Norton? That by itself is very demeaning and disrespectful. How will, he will come with, Buster and bravado and wouldn't understand basic economic concept, concepts. I wouldn't lower myself to his level because I have to educate him while debating. Now, now that is so arrogant. It's so demeaning. It's so disrespectful. This, as much as you may not respect Aubrey Norton in your own personal opinion, this is still someone that is that is representing 40% of our, our country. Because when you look at our voting patterns, at the end of the day, the PNC, APNU, AFC, still represent 31 seats in parliament. So though each one of those seats represent about 6,000 people, 7,000 people. So... For you to sit down there and say, I don't care about his opinion. I would never debate him. I, I, I don't value him. I mean, I, I would never debate a Norton, the leader of 40% of the country. What does that say? What does that speak to? That's, that's, that's disrespectful to the people of the country that have put him there. And you can argue that in your opinion, they shouldn't have done it, but they did. Too bad. All right. And now I get back to my conversation about Japan. If you're sitting there having the current ruling regime demeaning the opposition, then how are you expecting people to work together? 
we got to get out of this idea of, oh, it's the APNU that's breaking this country down. Clearly, in that article, you can see that it's on exactly the same on both sides. As a matter of fact, I listened to most of the best press conference. And, and I will make mention as well. I'm in quite a few of these political groups or, or, you know, these Guyana forum or Guyana politics groups with hundreds of people inside of them, ministers and government officials, citizens and so on. And I never, it never fails to, to, to entertain me because the only thing, just like Barra Jagu's press conference yesterday, the only thing they ever say is when somebody says, well, the oil contract is, is poor. It needs to be re renegotiated. Their immediate response is, well, as APNU do it. What do you mean? But you're in power now with, 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 with the capability of renegotiating the contract. Tell us why you are not renegotiating the contract. Tell us why you previously to the election stated that you think the contract needs renegotiation, but is not doing it. And as a matter of fact, I just read in the papers today again that they're actually extending part of it. So I'm sorry. Fight this down any way you want. But we're looking at two political organizations that are identical, that will tell you anything they want to tell you to get into power, and then do whatever they want to make sure that they are satisfied. Because you want to know who has benefited since PPP has gone into power? The PPP politicians. You want to know whose lives have been significantly upgraded? The PPP politicians. Their friends, their family. All the ones talking the loudest, those are the ones that have benefited. When in you sit down, and I want you and I want people to be a little bit selfish, because at the end of the day, your political decision has to do with your choice. Now I have to ask you, if do you feel that your family is well taken care of? Do you feel safe every time you go out to catch a bus? Do you feel safe walking into the hospitals? Do you feel like your child is being educated? Do you feel that you are being paid enough at your job? All right, and then you wonder to yourself, oh, wait a second, Yes, I do. Great. And absolutely great. And I'm happy to hear that. And I think, I hope that most of the country can say that. But if you're one of those people that are not saying it, then you really have to start to think to yourself, then why am I not benefiting? Why am I following or voting for a party if I'm not benefiting? Because at the end of the day, they are there to make your life better. Politicians are public servants. You are the public. You, 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 the person looking at me right now, the politician's job is to make your life better, okay? And if you are not feeling that way in five years in a country with the highest GDP, one of the highest GDPs in the world now, with less than a million people, anywhere else in the world, Guyana's a village. If you don't feel like your life has changed within that five years, change your vote. Change your vote. All right? It's what it is. And then you know what? You know what? That's the beauty of democracy. You keep changing the politicians out till somebody actually benefits you. Be a little selfish. Think about your family. Think, you know, everybody benefiting in their own ways. You know, whether you work in a GRA and you got your little hustle, whether you're a police, you got your little hustle, whether, you know, you're a teacher, you got your little lessons or whatever you're doing. You're thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'm trying to make a couple dollars extra and I'm making a little bit more than I was on the app. No. My question to you is, is it enough that you're going to leave your child with a, a bright future? Is it enough to buy yourself a new Allian? Or is it enough that, you know, you can buy a property to put down to rent? Is it enough that you can take your family on vacation once a year? Is it enough that if your house burned down, you wouldn't have a problem building it back? Because you could go to the bank and your salary is definitely enough. Don't worry about the off the books money because the money's disappeared just as quick as it has come. So my question to you is, do you feel comfortable in your life? Do you feel stable? Do you have a, a future being built for your family? And if that's not the case, if you just study and oh, I just get them a couple of dollars fast, then you need to worry. You need to wonder to yourself, what am I doing political, politically? Because we're in a hyper-political country here. Every decision the politicians make, they have a hand. And this is where constitutional reforms comes in. And this is where I mean we need to distribute the power back down. But as it is, the politicians, the government controls every aspect of the society.
Now, I have to ask myself, as a young businessman in this country myself, um, I have to ask myself, I've, I, want to, let, I, I want to expand my business. I want to open, you know, I want to distribute my product in other parts of the country. Um, I want to produce more of my product. Um, now, I have to wonder to myself, well, how exactly do I go about expanding? I how do I get land? How do I buy more vehicles to deliver? How do I bring in equipment that I can, you know, automate, automate or, you know, raise my production levels? And I wondered to myself, why is it every day I feel like I'm fighting against the government to do business here? Why is it that every single aspect of the society, even down to bringing a product into this country to sell, or bringing some equipment in. I gotta fight against GRE. I gotta fight against customs to get my product in here. I gotta go and give a man a raise. I gotta try to, to hope that, that I could ask for some sort of some, some sort of godsend, get a duty-free concession. I need to buy a vehicle to distribute my product. How do I get in a duty-free concession as a young, small businessman to expand my business? Why does it feel like everything I have to fight? I don't even want to get into the details of my security bills, worrying every day because my business has been robbed twice. Every week, every week, one of my employees gets robbed. Every single week. I'm saying this to you as a fact. Every week, one of my employees gets robbed. Going home, walking to the bus, in the bus park, carrying this, pick, getting a salary and, 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 and heading home, in the home itself. I don't know what to tell y'all. I don't know how to explain this any further. And, and then I sit there and say, well, how am I expected to grow? I can't, I just spent, I, I'll give you another person example. I just spent $100,000 fixing a fridge because every day my electricity fluctuating up and down and my fridge keeps blowing. My, my condenser, my evaporator, it just keeps blowing. What am I to do? How do I grow in a country that I can't even get consistent electricity? Not to mention I'm paying through the teeth for it. This inconsistent electricity. Oh, don't worry. They're building a, a, a natural gas plant. Come on. I, I, I welcome the natural gas plant. I welcome the natural gas. I'm not a fan of, of, of fossil fuels. I've, I've said this loud and clear many times. I think the same money we purchased um, that this, this fossil fuel natural gas plant, I think we could have sold the gas. I, I know an American company is actually talking to them about a floating um, natural gas vessel to turn it into liquids and, and ship it out. I think we should have been doing that from the beginning because American Canada are already dependent on it. Why didn't we take that same money and put it into hydro? Just how many years ago, all Barajag, you and all the PPP government said is we have to build Amelia Falls. This is the future. Can bring the exact same spiel. It'll bring our electricity costs down by 50% and we'll have unlimited electricity for all our manufacturing and it'll be a wonderful, wonderful situation. Why didn't we just do that? Why didn't we take all those billions, billions of dollars and just build the, the, the same hydro plant? It's the exact same thing. They're the ones that told us how well it will work. The, and, and I agree with it. I mean, look at Niagara Falls. It's been running for what? 40 years now? And it powers half of Ontario and New York. Why don't we have, why are, I'm land of many waters, why aren't we doing that? Why are we building a fossil fuel plant? But anyway, as we said, this is why we need some balance in our system because things like this can be vetted properly instead of somebody just making a deal in their own house you know, sitting down in the living room saying, let me, uh, let me build this thing and, and we can make a wee little raise. But a couple of years ago, you were telling us you want to build something else. It's not making any sense. It's not making any sense. The natural gas can be sold the same way. Nonetheless, I, I was talking to you a little bit about my travels as, as, I, as I was going on. And, and being able to be in a country like Japan, you know, I, I, the streets are clean. The people are well taken care of. Society works as a unit. The government takes care of the people. You pick up the phone, there's police. As a matter of fact, there's not that many police because there's not that much crime because the people don't have a need to steal as much. Like anywhere else in the world, there's obviously, you know, little social ills here and there. But I can tell you in Japan, I, I didn't see one single beggar. I didn't see any stray animals on the road. Um, I, you know, 
the public transportation is safe and secure. Everybody's extremely polite. Everyone is helpful. I mean, honestly, it was really one of those really, really eye-opening experiences. And it was fantastic to be immersed in something like that, in a society like that. But more importantly, it really, really opened my eyes to how far back we are in Guyana. As you sit there and say, well, look at these. These are simple, simple things that we can put in place, but it just doesn't work. Stop blaming the people. Stop blaming the people. You want to know, and this I know hit home, hits home to a lot of people. You want to know why there's drunk, so many drunk drivers on the road? You want to know why there's so many people speeding? Because there's no repercussions to the action. Okay, I had a police sit down, come, come and sit down with me a couple of days ago. And we, I gaffed him like normal, you know, how, how things on the road, you know, how, how things going and so on, you know, any issues, etc. The man said, honestly, Jabur, it's getting hard for me to do my job. I says, you got to elaborate, hard how? He said, at the end of the day, if I pull over somebody on the road, let, let's, say, let's say somebody runs a traffic, a red light. And I go and I catch them and I stop them. He said, I did it a couple of days ago. I stop a man for running a red light. The man, the man looks at me, he says, do you know who I am? I says, honestly, it don't, the police says it doesn't really matter. But you broke the traffic light. I have to, you know, charge you. He asked the driver to, es to, to follow him to the police station. He's going to escort him to the station. By the time he got to the police station, his commanding officer looked at him and said, why would you bring this man in? You, you don't know who this is. And the police officer is like, what do you mean? He broke a red light. It don't matter who he is. My job is to stop people from breaking the law and to reprimand them if they do. No, 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 absolutely not. This man is X, Y, Z. And, I, and the policeman is like, and now I'm in punishment for bringing this man in after breaking the law. So he's like, and then all of a sudden, he pays his bribe to my commanding officer. And that's it. He says, I now, I am now the bad one in the scenario. I am now the one that's being reprimanded. He gone, the driver gone his way. And my commanding officer a little bit richer. So the man said, look, the man's like, Jibor, what do you want me to do? And I might as well pay. And I might as well just collect the money on the road. It don't make no sense. I get in trouble for doing my job. So I might as well just collect my money. I might as well, and I've been paid that much money, so I might as well collect it where I can collect it. This is where we are in a society. This is the breakdown. Drunk drivers, speeding drivers, no rules. Look at the minibuses, do anything you want. Look at the sand trucks, do anything you want. And then they can pick, put a headline in the newspaper and they can say, oh, um, we, 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 we're, we're cracking down on all of these things. And then guess what? Nothing. I drive every day on the road. You drive every day on the road. Have you seen any change in society? Or have you seen the minibus drivers and the truck drivers and everybody getting worse? And those big private companies, those big private uh, um, contractors, no, no issue at all. Pick up the phone, make a call. Problem solved. Oh, you knocked down somebody? Too bad for them. Oh, you crash into somebody? Don't worry, you're not going to be charged. And we sit here and we wonder why these breakdowns in society, why, why we're ending up. Well, these are the type of things. And then... Let me get to let me get to my little bit of a controversial statement. But then you get to the beautiful painted picture on the newsroom and uh, and uh, and uh, and the government pages. Look, we play in cricket for charity. Look how much money we raise. Millions, millions of dollars. Don't you think we're so wonderful? <laughs> so so this is controversial and I know it's definitely not personal, but somebody made the statement that we should probably look into, we should probably look into the world record for, because they're pretty sure that um, the, the last lemonade sale at State House came up with something like 17,000 US dollars. And we said, well, how much lemonade they could have possibly sold? And everybody feels good. Oh my gosh, thank you for doing this. This is so nice of you, you know, and paint this beautiful picture. At what point in time are we going to start to wonder to ourselves, why is it that a country as a rich as Saudi Arabia per capita, one of the richest in the world with less than a million people, needs that much charity? Controversial. Take, run with your emotions, I understand. But I wonder to myself, 
why is it that this country has so many charity organizations in such desperate need? Let's talk about the same animal welfare that they've been, they've been doing. Uh, two organizations that I have a lot of respect for, Pause for a Cause and, um, and uh, Tales of Hope. These are, these are people that I know genuinely are concerned for the animal's welfare in this country and have done wonderful things, um, have been really a driving force to trying and getting the, the, the situation of um, whether it be stray animals or mistreated animals, abused animals under control in this country. And I wonder to myself, how is it that they are such in desperate need of so much finances because they have such, so many, so many issues when it comes to stray animals or, or, or abused animals that they literally don't have the capacity to handle it. Now, I wonder to myself, how, like everywhere else in the world, how is it that the government structure is set up to control these animals' welfare? is just a waste of time because i'll tell you right now the people that are doing it again this is not a personal attack but they they can tell you right now feel free to ask them they'll tell you how underfunded they are they'll tell you how it's a struggle they're just doing their best with the, with the little that they have so now i wonder to myself is isn't this a prime example of a structure of a system that has broken down that is not functioning efficiently or effectively and then the government coming in putting on charity events to give them all this money to make them look like they're the ones that are helping. But it is their system that is broken. They're the reason that the animals welfare organization, GPHC or something like that, GPSC, um, and uh, I can't remember what it's called, but they're, that government structure is non-functioning, which is why these organizations are, are, are so flustered, so flooded, that they can't even do their jobs effectively. They can't even do, I, I will ask every single one of them out there, do you not wish that you didn't have to walk down the road every day and see a donkey getting beat or a dead horse on the road because it's been flogged for pulling cat or somebody dragging a dog behind a car or, or, or stray animals everywhere? Isn't this something that you want? Don't you not want to have to do what you're doing? And, and, and let me tell you something, again, through my travels, it exists. There are countries in the world that stray animals are little to none. There are countries in the world that abusing an animal is almost just as punishable as abusing a human. Those are systems put in place to protect those animals. And guess what? It works because the government funds it and it's all state run. And it's, it's a system that is valued. Not the government holding a charity event every other, mo every other morning to give money to, to, to you, your private, your person that's taking your private life and helping dogs and helping horses and cats and anything that, that, that needs help. Now think about that for a second. Rather than sit down here and say, oh my gosh, thank God, the government doing so much charity work. Ask yourself why so much charity work is needed. You know, we come back to systems and protocols and, and we wonder why people like myself are this involved and I don't have to be, nobody has to be in politics. And if I wanted to gain big power and I wanted to, you know, be the forefront, I could have joined the PPP or the PNC. They got both of them hugely wide open arms. Please join us. They take anybody that would join them. But then I wondered to myself, how is that benefiting anyone in any way? I've been around in this country long enough. My daughter is 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 um, born here. I, you know, I've been in. I grew up in this system. I went to St. Joseph's. I, I, you know, I've done it all. And I, I wondered to myself, how is it that I can validly justify what these two parties have done? The PPP and the PNC both having ruled the way they have for the last equally for the past couple of years for the for, since our independence. Have they done enough? No, absolutely not. No, I still worry about my daughter every single day going out to school. And I'll give you one of those examples. I'm gonna ask the, the, the this is something very close to me. I'm gonna ask the operator to please bring up the Madia tragedy article from a couple of days ago. Um, Madia tragedy, financial support given 
to families after consultation. Um, President uh, Irfan Ali on Monday said his government's decision to provide cash support to families affected by the Madia tragedy was guided by robust consultation. This is something, uh, in, in quotation, this is something from consultation with the people. Just so everybody's aware of the situation, the government uh, has decided to give the Madia victims' families, the 20 young children that lost their lives, has decided to give those families 5 million Guyana dollars each as compensation for losing their child in the Madia fire. Five million dollars. I first of all, I can't tell you the anger that that brings out in me. Five million Guyana dollars is what you have valued those young children's lives at? This is a caring government? This is somebody that respects the people? Five million Guyana dollars? People are going to sit down here and say, well, I wish I had five million dollars right now. I need five million dollars. Are you willing to lose your child for it? And five million dollars, I'm sorry, can't even open a business in this day and age. Everything raising the way it raising. Can't definitely can't build a house. Definitely can't buy a piece of land. Five million dollars. Is this a joke? Is this what we call respecting the people of this society, of this country? The the COI um the commission has been commissioned, and um, Dr. Irfan Ali, the president of this country, did an interview last week. Um, I think it was another event, and then it was just a question that was asked on the side. I was watching the video, and they asked what the terms of reference, the TOR, is of the COI. What exactly is the scope of investigation? that the Commission of Inquiry will be doing into what occurred at Madia. And his response is they have a very narrow, strict scope of what occurred the day before, what occurred the day of, and what occurred the day after the Madia tragedy. And that is the areas that this Commission of Inquiry will be looking at into the Madia tragedy. So we're not going to discuss the fact that four other schools burned down within the last two years. Four other schools. Luckily, no children were inside. We're not going to dis we're not going to discuss the fact that these children were locked into that building like a cage, a state run building, a government institution. We're not going to discuss that. We're not going to discuss that there was no fire extinguishers. We're not going to discuss that there was a no smoke detectors for early detection. We're not going to discuss that there was no sprinklers to suppress the fire. We're not going to discuss that the fire truck showed up there with no water in it. That the, we're not going to discuss that the hospital didn't have the facilities or tools or personnel to look after these victims when they got there, the few that got there. We just, what are we, we trying to do? Just run away from blame? We're just trying to say that's not my problem? You're just trying to take a, a government institution, you're trying to say that's not your government responsibility? But don't worry, we've done a robust constitution, cons consultations and given them five million Guyana dollars. It's disrespectful. It's wrong. It is morally wrong. I am saying that the PPP government is morally wrong for giving those families $5 million and making them sign a contract that they cannot sue the government from that once they accept that $5 million. Of course they can accept the $5 million. They're desperate. They got nothing. It, they, how many people in this country are impoverished? That is taking advantage of those people. That is the truth of the matter. Now, I'm just going to double back on something for a second. Just to close my point on, on this matter, Dr. Um, Barajagdio had stated that he's not going to debate Norton. 
or, or people like Norton, right? whatever that means, or, or however disrespectful that is, right? What I would like to do here, and I'll call it out, I would like to state, I'm calling it out now. I would like to call Dr. Varajagdu, Aubrey Norton, and I'll pull one from our side, Mr. Timothy Jonas. Put them on, put, let's have a debate. Let's have an open debate. Let's put them all in a, in a, in a, in a stadium, right? Wherever you want to hold it, at, at, at um, Conference Center, at Theater Gill, at the, at the, um, the what's the, what the thing name? Anyways, any, any, any theater you want, all right? Let's, let's put them in a room. Let's put them up on a stage and let's ask them to have some hard questions. Let's get those three people in a room and have a real debate. You don't want to, you think that, that these people are below you? Then show us, prove it. I'm calling you out, all right? I'm calling out the other two leaders as well. I call out Aubrey Norton and I call out Timothy Jonas, all right? Let's have a debate on any topics. You want to discuss, you think your government has done so well? Let's bring it up. Let's bring all three of those to the table. Three respected leaders in this country. Let's see what they have to say. And you, we watch it in American politics all the time. Put the cards on the table. All right? That kind of disrespect that Barra Jagdio has shown Aubrey Norton or Air Finale has shown those Mario victims, put your money where your mouth is. If you're saying you're doing so wonderful for this country and you're doing what's great, let's have a debate. Let's open it up. Let's have an open discussion about it. Let's ask you some hard questions in front of an audience with people that can actually respond accordingly. Not, not the media. Half the media owned by PPP and half the other media owned by PNC. You, you take it at a press conference, what are you doing? You and Kaichor News having it out? The, 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 that's your means of openness? No, absolutely not. Let's have a proper debate in which all the other um, leaders of this country can speak their mind on the same topics. And then call each other out. You know, these are the kind of things that me as a young person want to see. All right? Because if I am to make informed decisions, if I want my life to be better, I need accountability. I need transparency. I need to see my leaders stand up and face the fire because that is what is required in leading people. You want to have enough respect for the people? Go for it. All right? Don't run and shy, shy and hide behind cameras and, and controlled environments. Open it up with people that got some real questions to ask you. I saw, I was very happy recently to see um, a PNC representative, El Sandow, and a economist um, who leans towards the PPP. Um, I can't remember his name. Do a UG, uh, do a UG debate. And that was wonderful. I quite enjoy those types of debates because you really get to hear from both sides directly what their opinions are on matters and what their plans are for the future. Then even more so, you get to hold them accountable. You get to hold them transparent. You get to hold them to their word. What happened to the 50% increases? What happened to UG being free? Blah, blah, blah. Right? That's what it's about. Um, nonetheless, on that note, guys, I know I am out of time. Um, I um, I had a few more articles and, and so on. I'm, I'm, my apologies. Uh, I obviously get continue on to these. I, I'm when you get me talking about people, this is what I've gotten into this for. This is why I'm doing this, because the people of the country are what matter most. Not, not roads, as, as, as was said not too long ago, the, the people can't eat concrete. They can't eat a road, all right? And unless the people are benefiting, unless the people's lives are being upgraded, I'm sorry, there's, that's not progress. I don't consider it progress, all right? You can debate it. If your life is getting better, that's fantastic. If it's not, then... Please, I'd like you to really rethink. We just had APNU in office. We got PPP in office. You can think about what your life has been over the last five years and uh, or, or 10 years. And if you have not significantly upgraded in 10 years of your life, 10 years, all right? That's a big chunk of your life. If your child is not going to be benefiting and you're, you're buying into all the continued promises, then you really need to start rethinking what you're doing politically, um, where you're valuing and 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 where your vote is going, because that's what it all boils back down to. Nonetheless, um, thank you for joining me again on A Politically Incorrect. Um, I hope I can shed some different perspectives. Um, I hope that you guys can be a, a lot more involved. I, you know, Feel free to reach out to me on the number um, on WhatsApp. Uh, I do go through the comments as well. Please feel free to share your opinions there. Um, and please share the video uh, as much as you can, because that's kind of how these conversations, for all of you that may agree with me, the 10% out there, as I like to say, please share the video as much as you can, because 
uh, these are the type of things that, you know, start the little ripples in society to garner that change, especially for the young folks out there. Um, we need to start st stepping up for our future. All right. On that note, uh, please, uh, we've had crazy hot weather in Guyana, so please be safe. Hydromet has put out um, some warnings recently on a drought that's coming um, and the heat wave that's coming. As you can tell, what's been coming with that is some extremely violent uh, thunderstorms so please be careful out there i know it's dangerous um whether too hot or too rainy um this is how our country's uh built uh, you know geographically one of those things we can't control but please be safe out there everyone have a wonderful weekend and i will be back here next week with you on apolitically incorrect thanks <laughs>